Welcome to the Unconventional Path, Entrepreneurship Stories and Ideas. Hello, I'm Bela Musitz. And I'm Mike Wasserman. Hey, Mike, today's guest on the podcast is Stephen Blue. He is the CEO of Miller Ingenuity. He's also a keynote speaker and a best-selling author. We had a great conversation about leadership, building organizations, and focusing on your customer. Hey, and if you're watching the video version of this podcast, turns out Steven's video was not working. So the video is just of me. Well, Bela, you know I love companies like Miller Ingenuity, right? These are companies that create super important, kind of ubiquitous products. Um, and these are companies that most people haven't even heard of, right? And in Germany, they call these hidden champions, right? And I've seen this in the US as well. But um, Miller Ingenuity is one of these hidden champions, right? So I'm pretty excited about the conversation that you had. Um, so I think let's get right to it. and You'll learn more about Miller Ingenuity and more about some of the leadership philosophies of, of their CEO, Stephen Blue. Sounds good, Mike. Here we go. Hi, Stephen. Welcome to the podcast. Well, it's my pleasure to be here, Balo. It's nice to talk to you. Yeah, that same here. So let me ask you a question. If, if you're at a social event, a non-working social event, I mean, it has, doesn't have to do with work, and uh, someone comes up to you and they introduce themselves and you introduce yourself to them and they ask you the question, Oh, very nice to meet you, Stephen. What do you do? How do you answer that question? Well, you know, I can give a, the short version or I can give the long version. Usually in, in social situations, unless I'm networking, I just give the short version, which is uh, I'm a CEO of a life safety company uh, globally. I'm a five times best-selling author. I'm a professional speaker. I've spoken at uh, Harvard Law School, Carnegie Hall, and... Uh, a lot of other big venues, including uh, the United Nations. And uh, I'm a film producer. Some people know who Jay Abraham is, considered maybe the, the best marketing genius of our time. I was a co-producer in a film about uh, his life. That's kind of the short version. Wow, that's a pretty impressive short version. Uh, let's talk a little bit first about your company. Uh, so uh, tell us a little bit about what it does and what it's focused on. Well, Miller Ingenuity, we just uh, celebrated our 75th anniversary. And as you know, uh, there aren't, if you go back 75 years ago, most of the companies that were around then that anybody knew about is, have disappeared. Yeah, for sure. So that's a pretty big achievement. And, and I would accredit that to uh, our resilience and our versatility. And we sort of morphed and changed over the years. I've been the CEO for almost 25 years. And we make all kinds of uh, life safety systems from, from mechanical and plastic to highly sophisticated electronic uh, systems that save people's lives. Uh, you know, every now and again, you see people working on the tracks. They're either grinding or they're doing something. Well, a lot of them get killed every year because they don't realize that the train's coming down on them. Mm -hmm. And we have some systems that uh, totally prevent that. And we're a third generation company also, which is... Uh, uh, pretty highly unusual because as you know, you were a venture capitalist. It, most of them don't survive the second generation and to be right. in the third generation is a pretty, uh, and that's a testament to the shareholders and the board that have an interest in uh, not making a quick buck uh, with the sale, but uh, in sort of, you know, evolving the company and uh, promoting it and, and supporting it. Yeah. Yeah. So is the market uh, mainly uh, industrial applications or is it for things in the home as well? No, it's, that's a good question. It's uh, entirely industrial. In fact, if you look at uh, every passenger rail system and every uh, freight rail system in the United States has my parts on it, every single one of them. Oh, in wow. You're at a, like a highway crossing and you see a train go through there and the wigwag lights are uh, lighting. Most of those uh, are LED signal lights these days instead of incandescent bulbs. And we were pioneers in that field. In fact, we have the uh, largest installed base of LED highway crossing signals in the world. And as you see that locomotive go by, I guarantee you, every locomotive you see has got my parts on it in the United States for sure. And most of them around the world. Oh, wow. Wow. So in addition to sort of... Uh... Uh, uh, locomotives, uh, trains, uh, that transportation sector. What other sectors is the business in? That's it. It's a, it's entirely in the passenger oh. rail sector and the uh, freight rail sector, which generally 
you know, you, you, you've, you've looked at a lot of uh, balance sheets in, in your time. Uh, we just have uh, partially because of the industry we're in and partially because of what we do. Our earnings are reliable and repeatable, and you can just you can go to sleep at night not worrying about it because plus or minus ten percent. Uh, we're all generally twenty five percent earnings on, on our uh, sales dollar, so you know we're we're pretty reliably uh, earning company. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, certainly, you know, it, I'll editorialize for a second here, but it, it seems like our, our rail system, our rail transportation system, I mean that in a broad sense, both passenger mm -hmm. and and uh, freight, uh, compared to many other countries, it is is really second class. Oh, yeah. uh, and and I, I think that's that's a place that we as a nation missed the bullet on that one. Uh, having traveled extensively uh, both to Europe and the Far East, you know, traveling by train there is pleasurable. <laughs> it's yeah. quite nice. Oh yeah. oh yeah, and if it has a schedule of twelve oh two, it'll leave at twelve oh two. Yes. And if it's supposed to arrive at one ten or one eleven, it'll arrive at one eleven. I've been, you know, same as you. I've been in European trains and, and uh, the bullet trains and in China and Japan. And uh, the big difference, the big difference, is the United States in the sixties decided to plow all their money in the interstate highway system. Right. That's right. And yep. Europe did exactly the opposite. They plow plowed their money in uh, in uh, transit and passenger rail. The other thing is, you know, we sort of have um, only one uh, one one rail system that runs across the country for passengers. That's Amtrak, and that has a really deplorable record. But that's mostly because most of where Amtrak uh, uh, tracks are, they don't own the tracks. The freight right. railroads do, and so they have right. to pull off of the siding and let. And the freight railroads don't know when they're going to be, where they're going to be, and when they're supposed to be. It's just the way. When I got into this industry almost you know, 36, 37 years ago, I was amazed to learn that the railroads didn't know where their cars were. Yeah. They couldn't tell me where their cars were or when they're – and dial forward 36 years, Bela, and they still don't know. Yeah. So, that, yeah, you know, that's a problem. But, uh, but still – uh, freight rail has about 40% of the market share in the United States. Truckers have the other 60%. That's because yes. they're more, more reliable. Yeah. Is is that increasing or decreasing, or is that pretty much been how it's been for a period of time that's, now? That's, that's a good question, Bela. It's pretty much what it's been forever. And uh, every, yeah, I just went to a conference in New York about you know stuff in the rail industry. And they're talking about the same thing they were talking about 20 years ago. We yeah. got to get more share from the truckers. We got to do this. Got to do that. More reliable. Da, 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 da. And uh, it's just been pretty uh, stable. The one thing railroads do have for them is they're ecologically more friendly than trucks because mile per mile per gallon of fuel expended, it's much more uh, environmentally friendly. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that's a real shame. I, I've I've always. Uh wondered about that why 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 we as a nation haven't embraced that a, a little more um and improved it and and made it what it what it can be and is in, in many other countries and uh you know i it's funny you you you're talking about amtrak i can remember probably 20 25 years ago i was a i was on a panel and and they were talking about amtrak it was about transportation in the capital region of new york state and uh they were talking about uh, Amtrak and how they were. Somebody had a proposal to to uh, bring high speed Amtrak service between Albany, the capital of New York State, and New York City. And you know it was going to cost I don't know how much money, and you know it would cut the travel that time down from two and a half hours to I don't know hour and a half or something. And so everyone's going around on the panel and they're and they're, and they're talking about oh how great this would be and. Finally, the moderator asked me a question and, 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 and I said, well, I said, the biggest challenge is, is not for me, the two and a half hours it takes today is that it's unpredictable when I will get there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you could, if by reducing the time and if it's still unpredictable, yeah, that, that's, right. that's not an improvement. <laughs> yeah. What good is that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so, you know, m make it predictable. And and then it's then I then I can plan around it. But when it's unpredictable, that variability is the thing that kills you. Yeah, that is, and it's you know they've been talking of high high speed rail forever. We're going to high yes. speed rail from 
Minneapolis to whatever, you know, we're going to build tunnels, we're going to do all kinds of stuff. And then they run into all kinds of obstacles, right? Right. You got to grab the land, you got to buy the land, you got to, you know, satisfy a million constituents along the way. And then the the uh, dollars per mile are unbelievably high. Yes. A so million dollars per mile to do that. And it just never passes muster. Yeah. And, and like I said, I don't think it's about the speed. It's about the reliability and the service. Yep. yep. And, and that just doesn't improve. Uh, well, Amtrak is uh, basically a government en- entity. And, you know, everybody knows government versus private is sort of like not not quite that efficient. Right. Right. Well, when, when you're a monopoly, you don't have to be. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Right. You give you give them what they what you got. If they don't like it, where they're going to go? Yeah, yeah. Hey, so Stephen, I have another question for you. How has uh, COVID impacted impacted your business? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what. Um, we came out of the pandemic with a balance sheet that balance sheet that was stronger than when we, when we went in. And I tell CEOs all the time. Uh, in fact, I wrote a piece for Industry Week the other day on uh, the next pandemic. Right? I don't know what it is. Is it health? Is it who knows? Right. And I said, the only way to be sure that you can survive, you can't predict what it will be and you can't predict when it will be. So don't even try. But what you can do is you can strengthen your balance sheet. And that's what I advise CEOs all the time. Get your balance sheet strong and then you could survive no matter what happens. So we went into the pandemic. We lost, oh, I don't know, um, Bela, about 25% of our sales, maybe 30% of our sales year over year from wow. 2019 to 2020 or 2021. Yeah. But uh, so we made a little less money, but we didn't lose any money. And uh, this is an important point. I didn't lay off one single employee, not one, because I knew that when we came out of the pandemic, I'd need to hire them back and I might not be able to get them. And look at the problem most companies have today. That's right. The labor shortage. And that's because they cut cut their costs right away because they had other costs, right? You, you don't always have to cut, cut labor costs. Maybe your marketing expense is too high. Maybe your overhead's too high. There's all kinds of things that you could be spending money on that maybe you shouldn't. But yeah. The first lever that a lot of CEOs uh, reach for is to cut the workforce, and that's just a dreadful mistake. So I didn't do that. So when, when it did snap back, and it snapped back for me in about a six-month period of time in 2021, you know, we had the deep trough in uh, March to to July or August, whatever it was in 2020, when, you know, the government business, everything just shut down. Yeah. And then it snapped back a uh, third or fourth quarter of 2021. I was able to take share from my competitors because I didn't have to screw around trying to find employees. And I didn't cut my inventory. I didn't do any of that. And I was able to snap right back with the uh, with the challenges. Yeah. Now, on the passenger rail side, it decimated the passenger rail industry because they went from, you know, ridership, uh, whatever it was to like 20% of what it was before. When that happens, they don't spend money on anything but fuel. And so they're not buying my products. They're not buying my services. And, uh, and it's been a slow recovery in the passenger rail industry. I'd say they're probably about to 60, 65% now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have, I, I assume you have manufacturing facilities and production facilities. Yep. Yep, I've, I've got one. Yeah. And, so and what? Uh, so. I'm sorry. Say that again. I spoke over you. I'm sorry. Uh, I have one manufacturing facility in uh, little old Winona, Minnesota. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what did you have to do there to sort of accommodate the various different restrictions that COVID brought yeah. uh, for your manufacturing facility? Well, we had to stay on top of it. Uh, we were uh, one of those lucky businesses in the shutdown where uh, considered an essential business. So we made sure that every single, as an example, we made sure every single one of our employees had uh, a letter that, that declared us as an essential business because when they're coming back and forth to work, you know, some, some cops were stopping people because they weren't <clears throat> supposed to be on the streets. Wow. And yeah. The last thing I could afford is to have people not to be able to come to work. We were very, very careful in our uh, uh, disinfecting protocols. And uh, so we were able to, you know, satisfy employees that they were safe in, in the plant. And so we, and, and of course I had to work with legal on what, what could I do legally and all yeah. that because it gets pretty tricky, but we were right on top of what the changes were and what we had to do. And one of my directors commented that we had a very robust response 
to the shutdowns and to the new uh, restrictions. And of course, that evolved over time because if people don't feel safe in their workplace, they're just not going to come. And then, you know, you run into the next problem, which is vaccines. As an employer, should I require my employees to get a vaccine, right? Yeah. Now yeah. that's kind of loosening up a little bit. But uh, the only I didn't do it except in one instance, because it's just my personal belief. It's not my place to uh, mandate vaccines. The only place I did it is uh, we do a significant amount of business in Canada. And Canada requires vaccine to enter the country. And so I said to people that had to travel to Canada for work, I said, I don't have any choice in this, guys. It's the Canadian government. And, and I only lost one employee over that. Yeah. That uh, decided not to take the vaccine. Yeah. 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 Those were certainly some difficult times. So for, for you, uh, getting back to sort of leadership uh, and the next pandemic, whatever it is, what lessons did you learn uh, besides the balance sheet one uh, about, you know, preparing uh, and sort of leadership uh, attributes uh, when you enter, when another one of these, the next big storm comes? Well, it's not, you know, it's not, that's a good question, Bailo. It's not any different than it is in normal times. Leadership is the number one cornerstone of leadership is communicate with people. Tell them the truth, be honest with them, tell them what the, they should know, what they need to know, keep in constant communication. And, uh, you know, a lot of leaders treat people, employees like children. God, yes. if I tell them this, they might quit. If I tell them this, they might, oh my God. Uh, and you have to treat people like adults. Give them, give them the facts. Give them the truth. Now, there's some things, of course, I can't tell them, but everything else is fair game. And I say all the time: tell people what they need to know. Tell people what they want to know, and don't treat them like children. Treat them like adults. And guess what? They'll probably act like adults. And I, I would say that's the number one thing that I learned was uh, what your normal communications flow is. You have to up it in a pandemic because because people are deluged and barraged with media and everything's falling down yeah. and the world's going to come to an end and they need some uh, uh, voice of reasoning and sanity, if you will. And then that's what I give them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a great point because I, I, I have two, two, two things I'd like to say. One is that I've always been a firm believer that, you know, 99.9% .9 of people want to do a good job. Yep. And part of leadership's responsibility is helping them do that good job by giving them yep. the tools and the information so exactly that they right. they do the things, um, and 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 I think the other the other piece is uh, I, I think as uh, leaders often oftentimes uh, you if you don't communicate information, someone else will, yep. and it may not be accurate. So the the void if you don't fill the information void or the communication void, someone else will fill it for you. And, and and that's when you get you know rumors about things going on in the business and stuff that yeah. are oftentimes take on a life of their own. And once they start, man, they're hard to stop. They, they always do. And where are they getting that information from? Their neighbors, their friends, old Uncle Joe, who's right. telling them this. And you know, it's like the vaccine uh, situation. Uh, I know the the person that declined to take the vaccine. I don't know this, but I'm pretty sure probably didn't get make an informed decision based on what his primary care doc told him. His neighbor probably told him or the media probably told him. And right. uh, that, that <clears> information <throat> void that, that gets filled by somebody, you're right, it does take on a life of its own. And uh, by the time it, you even know what's going on, it's almost too late to stop it. So you just got to make sure you're constantly communicating with people. Sometimes there's nothing to say. So, so I'd get people together. I'd say, guys, update for this week. I don't really have an update this week. What kind of questions do you have? And, right. you know, nobody wants to ask a question in, in a room, you know, generally. So you have to encourage that. And then I just uh, take a Q and a for a half an hour. Sure. An hour. Sure. So, uh, one of the big listener groups that we have for this podcast are, are entrepreneurs, uh, oftentimes first time entrepreneurs who've just started a business or, you know, they've been in business five, six years. Uh, so one of the big challenges I often think that that entrepreneurs have is sort of the relationship between the founder and the CEO and the board and how you cultivate that relationship. And you've been in, in a role like this for, for a long time and give lots of advice and written books on those subjects. Can, can you give us, you know, your top three sort of, you know, the CEO slash board relationship points? 
Well, you know, that uh, that's a good question. And that is, you know, you've got, as a CEO, you've got a couple of constituents, right? You got your employees, you got your customers, you got your board, and you got your shareholders. Okay. Sorry to tell you, the CEOs, you got to satisfy all of them <laughs> somehow. That's just the yes. way it is. <laughs> I often say to people, you know, running the company is easy, really, comparatively. Leading the board and uh, uh, relationships with the board, that's really tough because, you know, they're two steps removed and they, they have their own interests and bias and all that. And, and I spend, I probably spend most of my time uh, thinking about what I want from the board and what I want from the shareholders and how do I get that. Mm -hmm. And so when I, I obsess over board meetings, right, I'm, I'm always anticipating okay what's this director going to say i know i know him. i know how he is i know what he's going to do and this director and i know that and so uh, when that arrives how do i either counter that or play placate that or whatever the case may be so i uh, yeah and, and what's a half hour 45 minute board meeting can make the difference between success or not in your business because what especially if you want to do something different yeah right people don't want to do different things Bela, you know this. Absolutely. Uh, boards don't, boards, all boards ever want to hear about is everything's fine and everything's going to be fine, right? That's all they ever want to hear. And when you tell them something different, you know, a lot of CEOs wait till they have no choice but to tell them there's a problem. And a lot of CEOs won't, won't bring up an expensive opportunity because they're afraid they'll get shot down. And I tell this to CEOs all the time, you know, if you bring a proposition to your board and they shoot it down and uh, and that becomes a disaster later on the board is not going to blame themselves they're going to blame you <laughs> that's right and, and why because you didn't sell it so i spend a lot of time selling in the board anticipating what the board's needs are and therefore the shareholders and uh and i have to find a balance between all of those constituents and it's not easy but but it's doable yeah yeah no, that's that you're absolutely right. You you have to satisfy all of those constituents. Yeah. yeah. And and that and that's that's part of the challenge of being being a leader uh, or or CEO. Uh let me ask you another question. So, you know, I think uh, leadership I think always has this sort of uh struggle with how hard to push. And and you know, you can push real hard because you have to accomplish things. But then there's also warning signs that you're sort of pushing too hard and and people are getting stressed out. And and how do you sort of manage that? And what are the what are the signs and symptoms that you look for when you're if you're if you're starting to push too hard? Well, you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, I had a sales guy, uh, head of sales is a number of years ago, and he would would bring every possible initiative and opportunity you could possibly imagine. And no matter what it was to him, it was life and death. We don't do this. It's life and death. Right. And when you got somebody in a leadership position that's talking in those terms, that's your first warning sign. Nothing is life and death. And it's easy for, especially sales guys, you know, this too, they love to drag the organization and, and you know, you guys perform and then, you know, maybe I'll get the order or maybe I won't manufacturing if you could only ship i could get more sales and you know it, it right. goes back and forth and so that's the first thing. i actually had to let him go because he he kept insisting on dragging the organization through initiatives at warp speed that didn't need to be at warp speed you know when you're in a turnaround by the way i wasn't a turnaround i think we both share a, a, a similar place rochester new york yes I was in a turnaround in Rochester, New York for seven years. That's life and death, okay? That's warp speed, okay? But if you're not in a turnaround, nothing else is in warp speed. And so if you've got any parts of your organization that are trying to push at warp speed, the, the organization will crack. And and uh, when, when you'll actually see the signs of it cracking will be when you're missing deliveries, when, um, mm. this is a great example on the uh, Boeing 737 MAX platform, when the thing isn't performing the way you were told it would perform and uh, that, but then it's too late. So the warning signs I watch for is let's not push the organization too hard. If you have a great organization with great people, they'll push all themselves. You don't have to push them any harder. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and sort of back to your sales guy example, I think everything cannot be a crisis, right? Because if it is, then that's, then nothing's a crisis. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> So, so you have to, you have to sort of pick your, you have to sort of, you, you, you have to be respectful of employees 
and and I think, as you said, communicate and be upfront and say, look, folks, you know, for the next two months or next six months or next year, whatever it is, we have to really, really push hard because we are in a crisis mode. Right. And 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 we have to. And here's the goals that we're, we'll, when we get through them, you know, everything should be back to normal, so to speak, and, and, and things should be good. But, yeah, I've been in a couple organizations where everything is a crisis. And and after a while, that gets really old. It really does. And then uh, no one believes you when a, re- a crisis really appears. They go, oh, yeah, fine. Right, exactly. I've seen this movie before, so I'll just keep behaving the way I've always behaved. And you hit on a good point uh, about respect for employees. Uh, you know, these days you hear a lot of this, uh, what is it called, quiet quitting. Yes. Right? Yes. And now it's quit quitting or something. I mean, uh, that's been around for a long time, but now somebody named it. So now it's a huge crisis, right? If you go back, uh, uh, I think it was Harvard Business School did a, a, a survey this is probably 10, 15 years ago, what people value in an organization. And number one was not compensation. Number one was respect. Right. And, and it's just, and so that's the same thing that exists today, but all of a sudden we have a name for it, so it's a problem. If you respect employees and treat them well, as you said, give them the tools and the guidance they need to be successful, then get the heck out of their way and let them do it. Right, right. Uh, let's can we talk a little bit about competition and and sort mm-hmm. of how you how you sort of view competition and and how you pos- how you decide to position position yourself and your products and services against the competition? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I tell you in the in the rail industry, it's a very clubbish industry. It's small comparatively, right? Yeah. And I was in industrial automation before that. So, you know, I, I know the contrast and, and the comparison between a huge industry and a little industry, littler. And in the rail industry, it's like, oh, yeah, we're all kind of friendly competition here. And, you know, OK, you get this job. Maybe I'll get that job. Everything's fine. You know, I don't look at it that way at all. And I guess I learned early uh, from a guy by the name of Don Davis. He used to be president. I used to work for Alan Bradley years mm-hmm. ago when it was mm-hmm. Alan Bradley. And then it became Rockwell. And, and so he was the president of Alan Bradley, and then he became the president of Rockwell. And he said something to me once that I never forgot. He said, I hate my competition, and I want to kill them. And so the way I look at competitions, I, and I track them very carefully. Every month I uh, meet with my senior leadership team. We go over everything, margins, sales, uh, product development, progress, and all that kind of stuff. And we look at, and we know where the competition has taken a beat on us in which product lines and why. And so we watch the unit volumes on those product lines. In addition to being at the customer site, we can tell when they're there, right? But we look at all the unit volumes every month. And if there, if there's a, a, a mm-hmm. downturn in those unit volumes, then we, we probably know why we probably know where, and then we have uh, an opportunity to do something about it. Well, you need to stay ahead of your competition, right? If your competition is going to start cutting your, your price, you need to make sure you can cut your cost. Don't don't drop your price until you have to, right? Because you know you you can't raise it. Uh, if right. anybody knows how to raise the price of the customer after they've dropped it, please call me. I'd love to. I'd love to hear that. <laughs> so, but you have to be ready to drop your price and protect your margins and protect your product lines if and when it happens. And so we we watch that very carefully. We anticipate the moves the competitors are going to do. Uh, we know their weaknesses and we exploit them when we can. Mm -hmm. A lot you can do through uh, messaging and marketing, uh, and we uh, take every opportunity to do that. So, you know, you don't last 75 years if you haven't paid close attention to your competition. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the other things that that, uh, companies struggle with, particularly young, early companies, is pricing, how to price their product. Um, you know, many of them that, that make things, that have manufacturing facilities, you know, take their take their cost of goods sold and they multiply it by yeah. some number. And that's what they charge for their product. Yeah. That's the price. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts about pricing? Well, you know, that's the worst way to price. Exactly. That, that's, that's an easy way to price. That's the worst way to price because you know what? The customer doesn't care about your multiple. And I, and I tell CEOs all the time, uh, guess what? The customer does not want you to have profit, believe it or not. They'd be, you know, they always driving your price down The The purchasing guys are always bringing in, more competitors to look at your product lines and uh, they'd be happy as clams if you were breaking even. So you you can't price based on what your needs are. But what we always do, and I have some products that uh, have enormous margins in them. 
enormous margins in them. And if I did a multiple, they wouldn't have anywhere near that. And you take a look at what's out there, what the uh, what the competitor offers, and you raise that price as high as you can and until the customer really starts squealing. And, and I mean really starts squealing because yeah. you never yeah. meet a good person guy who won't tell you your price is too high. Right, right. And you don't want to believe that. And 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 do you have a, a philosophy for for the company's products that you know you want to be the 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 lower price out in the marketplace or do you want to be the higher price you want to be right in the average sort of how do you think about that? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I would never want to be the lowest price. I mean, I mean that's okay if you're a uh, Walmart because you'll you'll have the lowest cost too, right? Right. That's right. Your fast and all, which is a company right here in, in town that uh, has no no doubt the lowest cost, but that's an awful place to be. It's just an awful place to be because the 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 margin for error is very small. Yes. And by the time you realize you've made a mistake, it's too late to come back because you can't raise prices. And uh, I I I tend to like to be on the higher side, uh, and I spend a lot of time and money and effort in the messaging and the marketing of why we're worth that. In fact, we have one product line. Uh, we have a couple of product lines, but nobody can touch us in this product line. The patents have long since expired, but we have a killer process that no one has figured out yet, mm. and we have a, a really really low cost structure that no one has figured out yet. And so. If you're not ra- charging the highest and the hell out of that uh, product line, you're, you're making a big mistake. So I really try to position myself as uh, worth the extra money, and, and generally it works. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Uh, Stephen, we've been talking for for thirty minutes here now, almost. Uh, so I want to start wrap, wrapping this up. So I I know that uh, uh, you've written a bunch of books, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, you do some consulting and give talks, etc. Uh, can you just uh, elaborate that on a little bit? So if people want to reach out to you, they they know, number one, where to find you and the types of things that that you do. Yeah, I probably have this in the in the show notes. My company is MillerIngenuity.com. I'm not going to try to spell that, but right. if you put it in the show notes, people And my personal website is StephenLBlue.com. Either place, you know, connects to the other. But I, uh, I tend, I did a... Uh, uh, custom keynote speech for a, me- a major medical device manufacturer last year. And I, I generally don't like to do custom speeches. I like to pull something off the shelf, you know. Yes. But they wanted me to uh, uh, illustrate to them. Uh, and of course, in, in uh, medical devices, safety is critical. They wanted me to illustrate to them the dangers of losing a focus on safety and uh, and what can happen as a result. Good for them. They're 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 ahead of the curve. They want to make sure that doesn't happen to us. So I did a bunch of research with Boeing 737 Max disaster, the Challenger disaster, took out the airbags, and I custom crafted a speech for them that uh, they just absolutely raved about and they love. Yeah, I can do that. If you're a CEO or you're a board member and you want somebody to come in and sort of do that kind of thing, I can do that. Uh, I have all kinds of uh, keynote addresses. I do. I've done them at you know the Harvard uh, Law School. Yeah. And the United Nations, I can do that. I've written five books. Uh, one of them is a bestseller that I co-authored with Jack Canfield, uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul guy. And, mm-hmm. uh, and then, of course, I do a lot of uh, uh, consulting. I don't really like consulting much, Bela, only because people sort of, you come in and you tell them what they ought to do, and they go, no, 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 no. I right. can't do that. I don't want right. to do that. So I really don't like that. And in fact, generally, when I do, I say, okay, we're going to have an agreement. And you're going to pay me up front because three days into this thing, your subordinates are going to come to you and say, that guy's going to wreck the company if you don't get rid of him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People don't like change. <laughs> no, no, nobody likes it. I don't like it. You don't like it. You know, yeah. guys like you and I, though, understand it. And and we know it has to get done. So we do it. Yeah. Understand the necessity for it. You know, one exactly. of the big problems with change is that at least for the short term, it's more work for everybody. Oh yeah, that's true. That's <laughs> a fact. So, so you know that in itself, it it, it doesn't go in the plus column. No, it sure uh, doesn't. Yeah. And so uh, it. the board doesn't like it, shareholders don't like it, employees don't like it, your customers don't like it, nobody likes it. Yeah, yeah. But it's necessary. I, I, yeah. If you don't, if you don't change, you're a dinosaur. Absolutely. You, you go way of you go by the way of the dinosaurs. So, uh, Stephen, uh, my last question. Is there anything that I have not asked you or that we've not touched on that you'd like to share with the audience? 
Yeah, one thing, because I know a lot of your audience is uh, entrepreneurs. I've done a lot of that. I uh, yes. once started a company in Mexico that uh, was, a, was a terrific success. It was scary all the way. I was scared. I won't say what list uh, on your show. And so one point I make with uh, entrepreneurs is if it isn't scaring the hell out of you, it isn't worth doing. Yeah. And the other point I'll make for entrepreneurs is, so when I got done with that, I'm thinking, and I had a lot of personal funds on the line, all that stuff. I'm thinking, I got this entrepreneur stuff down. I, I, <laughs> oh my God, I could do no wrong. So then I started a company in Cuba. Yeah. It was a complete and absolute disaster. I yeah. lost a ton of money. And and this is an entrepreneur's world. Not everything's going to work out, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't give it all you've got. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. That's great advice. A great way to close the podcast. Uh, Stephen, thank you very much for being on the uh, podcast. I really enjoyed our conversation. It's my pleasure. It's nice to talk to you. Baylor, well, that was a really interesting interview, as promised, right? Some really interesting insights, I think, about leading and managing people and uh, in the COVID environment, uh, you know, w what were some of the decision points, uh, some of the principles? I don't know. What did you find most interesting? Where do you want to start? Ah, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff, I thought. Uh, one of them to me was this notion of, you know, they're a hardcore manufacturing business, right? They make stuff. It's not a service. <laughs> it's not, it's not software as a service, right? It's hardcore manufacturing. And I, you know, I'm always, uh, always amazed how we, we often his talk about historically how we've lost all of our manufacturing base in the United States and it's all moved over overseas because of you know, differentiations in labor, the cost of doing business, et cetera. But there are these hidden gems, as you were saying, where people have figured out how to manufacture products, hardcore, making chips, not computer chips, but making metal chips, as I call it, you know, mm -hmm. manufacturing products for, for, for an industry that's really kind of, you know, people don't think of the railroad industry as sort of a leading industry for the most part. Uh, and I don't know. I just, I just thought it was, uh, I, I thought that part was really interesting. What, what did you think? Yeah. And we saw during the, the, right, this strike or the threatened strike right over the summer in the U S right. Yes. If, the, if the rail industry shuts down, the whole economy shuts down. It's a high risk thing, remember? And so they jumped in and, uh, you know, kind of forced the mediation, um, right. which was pretty ugly, but, but yeah, this is a critical industry, right. And it's not as kind of sexy as, consumer electronics or or healthcare or anything like that but super important to the economy so it's like finding this really cool niche right that's really really important the business is going to be there and he knew that right so yep, that's, that's that, right. Was, that was pretty cool but you know it's one thing to be positioned in the marketplace really well which they are right this company is well positioned in a critical you know uh, uh, sector they have a great competitive position right like you said they're in every right essentially every locomotive um, and in lots of the signaling technology that crisscrosses the country and, and the world um, so how does he do it how does he do it in a place where a lot of people have abandoned right manufacturing right. jobs and outsourced That's right. it all um, yeah. And so, you know, he talked about communication and key, recognizing key talent and having a clean balance sheet. And none of this stuff in and of itself was rocket science, right? We teach this stuff in business school, okay? But what, what do you think made Steven's approach to this different than lots of other companies who haven't been able to figure this out? I, I think one of the things that struck me was, um, as being different, is he said, preserve labor. And, and if you think about most companies, when things get tight, what's the first thing they do? They lay off a bunch of employees. People. They lay off. And, and he, he was saying, That's, don't cut that first. <laughs> you know? And, and preserve labor because these are talented, skilled people who know how to do the job that they do. And, and we, I mean, we teach this, right? That how expensive is it to hire new people? It's outrageously expensive, right? To recruit them, to find them, to train them. You know, it takes them it, it, oftentimes months to be really 100% productive and knew all, know all the nuances of the particular job that they're doing. So I thought his focus on preserve label, labor, if at all possible, I think was, was, was struck me as a good key takeaway from our conversation. Yeah, and we've heard this from other leaders and managers we've talked to over the last few years on this podcast, right? And this really is a differentiator, is are you a people yeah. first 
Are people an asset or are people an expense? And you don't throw away your assets. It's not like you're selling them, right? It's not like it's a it's a piece of land or a building that you're selling and getting cash for. You're cutting them and you're just saving expenses. You're not bringing any more money in, right? right? And it's, it's, it's in, again, maybe there's exceptions to this, but I think in most cases, it's a bad strategy to cut people first or even in yeah. the middle, right? Should be the last thing you do before you turn the lights off, right? Yeah. That's the last thing that, we, that, that we're gonna do. Yeah. So I thought yeah, that was I, cool. I, yeah, I think oftentimes companies will treat labor people as a commodity. It doesn't matter. I just, you know, I'll just lay 100 people off and two months later I'll go find another 100. Well, there's a ton of hidden cost. <laughs> that, yeah, even in that, fast food, even in something yes. as kind of simple as working in a grocery store or fast food, which we learned are actually pretty important jobs, even though we don't give people the respect or the money that they deserve, right? But important jobs, right? Yeah. They're not, there's no, I don't think there's any such thing as a throwaway job anymore, right? Yeah. Where, oh, I can have somebody up and running in, in a day, no problem, right? Yeah. If I don't like, if you don't like it, you're fired or quit, right? Yeah. That's just an outdated mentality when it was like, okay, here, take this pickaxe or this shovel and dig that hole, right? That's the kind of jobs that that mentality works for. Yeah. I, I To me, the other takeaway was this notion of communication and, mm -hmm. and, being open and I think what he used the phrase, don't treat employees like children, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And and I you know I ran a I ran a manufacturing business for a period of time. I came in and turned it around. It was sort of struggling. And one of the things I did was every once a month we sat down and I went over the finances for the company for that month. And I did do a I did not do a fancy P and L sheet. <laughs> what I did was here's what our checkbook looked like. <laughs> Here's the checks we cashed. <laughs> here's the checks we wrote. And, you know, I had to sort of categorized. And here's the net for the month. And, you know, it really opened people's eyes to the various different things that as a manufacturing business we were spending money on. And, and I, I, it changed behavior. Right? It changed people's behavior. Why? Because they, they now knew. They now realized, you know, the welding folks, we used to weld steel and titanium. And, and, and the welding folks would throw away welding rod after it got to be six inches or shorter because it was a little more challenging to handle. Well, they didn't realize that each one of those pieces of welding rod cost $22 and they were throwing away a third of it. Right. Every day, <laughs> every day right. and not using it. Well, all of a sudden they realized it. I didn't have to say anything. Right. I didn't have to say no more throwing this stuff away. Right. They figured it out themselves. Why? Because they gave them the information. He trusted them. And it changed behavior. Right. Yes, trusted them, changed behavior. So I, I think that's really important. And the other piece of that I'll say is if you don't provide that communication, then others will. They'll make it up, right? And the rumor will get started. Because there's, if there's, if there's a, an information void, someone will say, well, you know what's going on over here? And the person they asked that question to doesn't know what's going on, but they'll make something up. Not maliciously. <laughs> But just because they want to feel like, you know, they I want to think, respond. Or I yeah, heard I think. or right. right. Exactly. So if you don't provide it, others will. And they'll fill in the blanks. So and, I thought those and, were two takeaways. Like, yeah. And like he said, give people the opportunity to ask you questions as the leader. Right. Yeah. You want to encourage that because you want them to ask you not to go. I mean, even with my students, it drives me crazy when they have a question about an assignment or something yes. and they don't <laughs> yes. come and ask me. They ask yes. one of their classmates and I get it. But if their classmate doesn't know then they just, right? It's like, it's okay to ask me questions, right? right? Um, so yeah, and he was such a good communicator. You could hear that in his voice and you could hear how he explained things. And I think that, you know, on one hand, you look at some of these ideas that he had about strengthening your balance sheet and how you treat human capital. And those are the concepts. Those are the strategies. And he, he was really shrewd about them, but communicating is how you implement them. And yep. I think this also goes back to these basics is how do you create a great company? You have to have a good system, right? You have to have a good, well, you have to have a good market. You have to have a good product. You have to have a good system for getting the product to the consumers. And you have to be a really good communicator to make sure that your team is functioning in such a way that you can deliver what you promise, right? And, and yep. do it profitably. And I agree. Easy to say, hard to do. But I think, you know, from the conversation that I heard that you had with Steven, he's somebody that gets the whole all parts of that, right? That it's a system and, and you have to do all of those well all the time. You know, you have to pay attention to all, all five of those, whatever that number right. was. That I just read all right. of it, but, um, right. but interesting. And, so, and yeah. I, I think 
you know, one of the ways I think about some of those things is they are necessary conditions for you to have a successful enterprise. They may not be sufficient conditions, but they're necessary. So you have to have them as a base foundation for any organization to be grow and to thrive and to be successful. You have to have, you have to do these certain things. Yep, a market, a product, a system to produce that product and the people to get the product to the people, to right. the customers at the right time, at the right price and do this in a way that's profitable and do right. it day in, day out. Right? That's right. And to make sure things like being open and transparent and communicating and valuing the people that make your business a success, those are all sort of necessary things you have to do and they have to be at the top of mind. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. Good stuff. What do you think? Time to wrap things up? I'm looking at my watch. Yeah, sounds good, Mike. Let's wrap it up. All right, listeners, thanks for joining us today. We hope you found this episode interesting and thought-provoking. As always, if you have questions about what we've discussed, please get in touch with us. Our email is bela.and.mike at gmail.com. Hey, and please do follow the podcast if you haven't already, and tell your friends about us as well. So until next time, signing off from upstate New York. See you soon, Mike. Thanks, Bela, from over here in Münster, Germany. See you next time.